Good. Cool. All right. So the seminar is going to be mostly focused around nutrition for the most part. Um, I go into training a little bit too and uh, per performance enhancing drugs as well. Uh, hey, Don, how's it going? Um, but most, most of the focus is going to be around nutrition. That's what I got most of the questions on. Uh, that's going to be, uh, I think, where a lot of people tend to struggle. But at the end, I will have an uh, uh, opportunity for you to ask questions too. So uh, if anything is unclear, especially in the training section or you want to go into training more, uh, we can go into that as well. Uh, okay, so this is going to be... Basically, oh, and, and first to introduce myself, uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar, uh, obviously my name is Dylan, uh, and I've been bodybuilding for about like 13 years, I wanna say. Um, and I basically, somewhere down the line, had gotten kind of fed up with the quality of service I was getting with coaches. Um, just basically, I felt like I was misled, there was a lot of misinformation. Um, so I went down this path of basically trying to educate myself with the most evidence-based um, resources that were available for bodybuilding. Um, I still use an integrated approach, so I don't use just science. I try to use a uh, personal anecdote as well, an anecdote with clients to uh, instruct my programming. Um, but for the most part, uh, I do try to lean into evidence when there is evidence. Um, we don't always have ev evidence for like the bodybuilding population or people trying to grow muscle, but uh, when we can extrapolate uh, and we have a good amount of data, then I tend to lean onto that as opposed to anecdote. So um, as far as this goes, so, so as far as muscle growth goes, really, uh, our main goal, obviously, is to add muscle. Um, we want to minimize fat accumulation. So uh, fat accumulation, unfortunately, does come along with uh, muscle growth if you want to do it optimally. Um, a lot of people have this misconception, and we'll get into it in a little bit, that you can grow muscle without um, adding fat, or you can gain tain. Uh, certain populations can get away with gain taining, um, but for the most part, most people need to be in a phasic or take a phasic approach to gaining muscle, meaning you are uh, in a dedicated phase in order to try to grow muscle. You're in a calorie surplus, you have adequate training volume, you have uh, enough sleep, etc. cetera. Um, also, we want to maintain health. So generally with, with uh, increases in body weight, um, to an extent, you may get some compromised health. Uh, with, if you stay within body fat ranges that are acceptable, then you may not experience as much compromised health or any. Uh, this also gets uh, enhanced. If you're enhanced, it basically uh, you get more health comprom compromised uh, effects, I guess is if, I, if I can't find a better term for that. Um, if you are enhanced, you generally may need to watch out for your health more. Uh, we also wanna increase performance. In performance tends to increase uh, or be a lagging indicator for muscle growth. So if your performance is going up week to week, then we can have a pretty good idea that you are creating enough stimulus to grow muscle. Uh, and then obviously everybody wants to look like Ronnie Coleman. At least I do. Uh, and then we got him here. So next slide. Cool, so how is new muscle built? Um, there are multiple ways you can measure muscle growth. Generally, um, it, there's something called the fractional synthetic rate. Uh, and that needs to exceed the fra fractional breakdown rate. Uh, fractional synthetic rate is essentially the measure of muscle growth. Fractional breakdown rate is the measure of muscle breakdown. Uh, more specifically, uh, one measure that tracks pretty well with muscle growth is muscle protein synthesis. So if muscle, uh, muscle protein synthesis is elevated and is, it is exceeding muscle protein breakdown, you have a pretty good idea that you're building muscle. Um, does that matter practically a whole lot? No, it's just good to know. Um, resistance training triggers a chemical cascade. Um, that begins the muscle growth pro process. So essentially you expose yourself to a load, you expose yourself to overload. And what happens is um, it triggers these chemi the chemical cascade that basically triggers muscle growth. So that input is basically what causes the muscle growth. That stimulus is what causes the muscle growth, or at least starts the process of muscle growth. Nutrition becomes important after that process is triggered. Um, and then we also have um, uh, indiv individual cells will become bigger, so they will, will hypertrophy. And then also, if you get to a certain amount of growth, um, the cells actually add nuclei. So, so what happens is, if you have a muscle cell, and you think of it, a, a nuclei in a muscle cell as like a, a, a communication tower, let's say for like an airport, right? The communication tower can only communicate so far um, out to like different airplanes that are flying out of the radius. And what happens is, if your muscle cell gets large enough, uh, the plane flies outside of the radius, essentially, you need nuclei, nuclei, you need more cell towers to be able to communicate. 
So if you have like a specific, like your muscle gets to a certain threshold, what happens is these satellite cells are donated and you have a larger communication area so that these, um, these, these uh, chemical triggers, these chemical cascades can actually communicate throughout the cell and you can um, experience growth. Uh, things like protein transcription, other processes that trigger growth as well. So we need those satellite cells. And actually satellite cells tend to be a um, trigger for uh, basically like, or not a trigger, sorry. They are, tend to be a genetic um, factor that contributes to muscle growth. So generally speaking, you'll see like large bodybuilders, they may have a lot of satellite cells genetically uh, to start with. We can go on to the next slide. And this is just a representation of uh, satellite cell proliferation. Okay, so what conditions promote muscle growth? So we need to be in a calorie surplus. So we need to be consuming more calories than we burn in a day. Um, it's also referred to as hypercaloric. Isocaloric meaning being you are at maintenance, you are not gaining weight. Um, so eating more calories than we consume, we need to be consuming adequate protein, which we'll get into later. Uh, as far as resistance training, we obviously want to be resistance training or what happens is we will be accumulating more fat or probably almost no muscle. You may accumulate some muscle tissue, but it's not anything that's significant if you are just in a surplus by itself. Obviously, we need adequate sleep as well. It's a big um, time when recovery happens, when muscle growth happens as well. And then we also want a lower stress, lower fatigue state as well. And this gentleman here is obviously upset because he is having a hard time eating enough food. Cool. Uh, so we actually have Sam up here uh, who's sitting in the audience. Uh, he uh, basically came to me and I wanted to represent uh, recomposition. So this is when he first came to me over on the left. This is actually not exactly recomposition because he actually gained 15 pounds here. Um, but you can see obviously more ab definition, more definition in the shoulder, all of his muscles really. Um, so this would be a good representation of recomposition. Now Sam isn't a true, true beginner, but I think with what happened was the stimulus was novel when he came to me. We changed a lot of things about his training and diet and what, as a result, he had this recomposition effect. Um, so recomposition, this gain taining thing I was talking about earlier, that's not super common. It tends to only happen in certain populations. So we have untrained lifters, beginners, sometimes when something is very novel, very new, um, that may also happen. Um, if someone is obese, what happens is they have so much stored nutrition, so much stored energy that they, uh, it's not a limiting factor for them to be able to grow muscle in a large deficit even, a very large deficit. Um, so there's, there's obese individuals who can grow muscle all the way down to um, you know, the, the, the healthy body fat ranges, 10 to 20% or 20 to 30 for females um, and, and not have any issues on the way down. So that's, that's a good condition. Most, most times if you have an obese client, you essentially would want them to be just in a fat loss phase for as long as they need to get, to get healthy. Uh, and I don't really need to touch on it anymore. And then as far as PEDs as well. So PEDs actually, I'll say from personal experience, if someone is taking performance enhancing drugs, it's actually generally first exposures. Uh, this, ha this, this tends to taper off. So I think a lot of people have a misconception. They take PEDs and what's gonna happen is that they're just gonna recomp forever every time they take a cycle. That doesn't really happen. Like for me, someone like myself who's advanced, I, I don't get a recomposition effect. Uh, the more muscle you grow, the harder it is to add tissue. And that's just really across all scenarios, and even when PEDs are introduced. Uh, okay, we can go on the next slide. So uh, why is this the case? So muscle gain and fat loss are two different processes in the body. It would be like, um, uh, what's a good, <laughs> I, I guess this is PC enough for this, but uh, like, let's say like you have your, um, your blood and your urine, for example. They're two different separate things, just to uh, give an analogy of, of opposites in the body. Muscle gain and fat loss are two different processes. They require energy. Muscle gain requiring even more energy because it is a very expensive process. So we need the raw materials for growth. Um, they are limited if they're being catabolized for energy. They're being burned for energy, right? If we're in a calorie deficit, we're at maintenance. We need enough calories to keep the lights on. In a deficit, we need enough for performance. We need enough for daily function. We're not likely to be building a lot of muscle if we don't have these excess calories to be donated for excess muscle growth. Uh, and then eating a calorie surplus triggers uh, muscle growth pathways, mTOR being one of them. Um, so just having enough calories triggers these, these, uh, these anabolic pathways. And actually eating in a deficit will trigger catabolic pathways such as AMPK, which actually blunt mTOR. They actually prevent muscle growth from occurring. 
And then, uh, as I mentioned, advanced trainees are more resilient to muscle growth. So again, like if someone is uh, now new to training, they're obese, uh, you know, on PDs, there's, there's lots of scenarios where they can recomp, uh, but it's not something that is ideal. And I don't always keep, like, for example, I don't keep a client um, in this, this, this case for very long. Uh, obviously, if they're, they're brand new, then I'll keep them in as long as they can get away with it. But at some point, we'll transition to a phasic approach. You get better results generally when you're you know, pushing your calories up and you have a, a large surplus. And you're basically just giving all of the nutrients, giving all of the stimulus for muscle growth. You can go to the next one. So uh, this is one I see a lot, clean bulking versus dirty bulking. Um, so uh, a lot of people have this misconception. I mean, it, it goes on either end. I think some people try to eat too much clean food and uh, what happens is they're limited because those foods are very filling. They have a lot of fiber, uh, so they can't eat enough food. And then as far as uh, dirty bulking, a lot of people have this misconception that they'll just get in a ton of calories and they'll be great. Um, in, in reality, so clean and dirty are, are nebulous terms in nutrition, in, the, in, the, in nutrition science and study of nutrition. Um, we all have an idea of what clean and dirty mean. Like clean is generally whole foods. There are generally many foods that are minimally processed, right? Dirty foods would be like your ultra processed foods, fast foods, stuff like that. Um, so I, I kind of push back in that regard, but, but I do kind of get where that comes from is like, there's not a defined term for these actual specific foods. Um, when people attempt to eat clean, they are limited, um, by the, uh, usually appetite actually. Um, so they don't tend to overshoot, uh, a, uh, their calorie surplus as much and they would gain less fat in a surplus as well. So that's what we kind of see there. And then we see someone who's eating only fast food as a majority of their calories well, what's gonna happen is they're gonna overshoot their surplus and gain a disproportionate amount of fat. They may gain some muscle, but they become limited because eventually you only get so fat to where you have to start dieting again um, due to health concerns or other things like that. You go to the next slide. So uh, this is a representation of uh, Eric Helm's muscle and strength pyramids. The hierarchy of importance for what he put was fat loss, but it can be easily adapted for muscle growth. So down here, Sustainability, sustainability and adherence are always number one. You need to be able to sustain the program, you need to be able to adhere to it as well. Um, so basically like if you were to ask somebody like, hey, could you do this diet for three months? And their answer is no, then you need to question if the program is sustainable for them. Um, is, it, is, it, is it sustainable enough for them to adhere to it with their current lifestyle and the limitations with their lifestyle as well? Um, obviously we need a calorie surplus. Uh, we need energy balance to be positive. Then we need exercise. Self-monitoring refers to like weighing yourself, uh, tracking your nutrition, uh, maybe actually keep, keeping an eye on like sleep, basically having some objective uh, measures to, in which you can compare and make adjustments to. And then we need uh, protein and fiber intake, probably the two most important. Fiber needs to be adjusted for satiety. This may be more, more important in a fat loss phase, but I usually uh, am the person to argue back against that. Fiber is very, very important for health. A lot of the time people get into a muscle growth phase and limit their fiber. LDL goes through the roof, risk of cardiovascular disease goes up as you're gaining weight as well. Uh, protein just being the most important nutrient for muscle growth. Uh, and then we need carbs and fats, uh, macros, and somewhat interchangeable actually in a lot of cases. And at the very top, supplements, where you see a lot of people think that supplements are like down here. They're really just the icing on the cake make the marginal differences. All right, we can go to the next one. Cool. So um, as I mentioned, calorie surplus earlier. So calories in, calories out is the main principle here. We need to be in a positive energy balance to grow. Um, a lot of people will debate this topic. Um, essentially, debating this topic is debating the laws of physics. So if anybody is ever debating calories in, calories out, as a principle, uh, I would just be skeptical of them already off the bat. Um, and so as far as this, this is the, obviously one of the most important things for body composition to change above um, sustainability of your program. Uh, you need to be in a calorie surplus to grow muscle. Simple, plain and simple, for the most part, I guess. Um, and then the contributors to calories in, calories out is you have calories in, which is usually consumed energy in the form of food. Calories out is actually your total daily energy expenditure. And there are many things that contribute to your calories out. So you have BMR. BMR is like the the calories it takes to keep the lights on for the most part. Um, there's some debate uh, of their, uh, over RMR and BMR, resting metabolic rate. Um, I can't remember what the actual delineation is between the two, but just keep in mind that it's just, for the most part, for it's not gonna matter a whole lot, but uh, BMR is just keeping the lights on, organ function, uh, basic processes throughout the body. Um, you have the 
non-exercise activity thermogenesis, referred to as NEAT, which is actually separate from non-exercise physical activity. So a lot of people get these two mixed up. NEAT is gonna be, like you'll notice right now, I move a lot. And in a calorie surplus, what happens is my body comp compensates in this way, and a lot of people do, is where you're eating an excess amount of calories and you move as a result, as a compensation result. It's not conscious movement. Like I may blink more, I may move my head more, I may move my body more. Uh, that's a result of being in an energy surplus. My body is trying to be efficient and trying to get rid of the excess nutrition, right? And that's, that happens when people are dieting. It's referred to as metabolic adaptation, right? People are dieting, they start slowing down, they start blinking slower, they start moving less. That is going to be what is one of the main things that gets compensated when you are um, in a different caloric state. Now, NEPA is non-exercise physical, physical activity. This is usually conscious activity. So like uh, a lot of my clients, I do step count, right? So that's actually consciously walking, right? Being aware of how much you're moving throughout the day. Um, usually I just refer to it as neat across the board. It's just easier to do. Then you have, oh, and, and these are kind of in order from like their contributions to total daily energy expenditure. So BMR is the highest contributor to to total daily energy expenditure. These uh, NEAT and NEPA are, are second. And exercise activity may be anywhere from two to 500 calories a day. Not a whole lot, but it's significant. Um, so that's just obviously your, the calories burned from exercising, right? And then at the bottom, you have the thermic effect of food. This is how many calories it takes to process your food, to use it for energy. Um, protein and fiber, I think, have the highest thermic effect of food. And we noticed that actually when people eat uh, less processed diets, like, like I was mentioning the clean and dirty, uh, foods earlier, they actually have a higher thermic effect of food. So if you're getting a mostly processed uh, diet, then you're going to have a lower thermic effect of food. You're going to burn less calories uh, as a result of processing your food. And then this is just a representation of, um, of energy balance, right? So you have um, cal more calories in, this would offset the scale and vice versa um, for that. Go the next one. Cool. And then this is just, again, going over energy balance. So uh, our total daily ener energy expenditure is going to be all of these things added up together. Uh, we need a sur surplus to grow. And essentially, uh, we're not like, so the, unfortunately the first slide didn't load, it had all the terms, but um, the terms anabolism and cat catabolism, anabolism being um, growth, right? Uh, we're not in an anabolic state all day if we're eating, um, we're eating in a surplus, right? We're, we're in this, this, this state. We're, we're in a flux of anabolism and catabolism. Uh, this is a representation of fat balance, so this could be like dieting, but it's the same with like uh, muscle protein synthetic rates, right? So like if you're, you're, say you wake up and you eat a meal, uh, you have the spike, but then you go work out, right? You're gonna be in um, negative protein balance, mu muscle, prote muscle protein breakdown. Uh, you're gonna be in a ca catabolic state, right? What, ha what really matters is the net balance, excuse me, across the day. So we're not gonna be like all anabolic. It's gonna be a balance of the two. And what really, ha what really matters is when you add both of them up, what state are you mostly in throughout the day? And then over here is just kind of a representation of why you would plateau, basically metabolic adaptation. Uh, essentially, these uh, tend to get compensations. You actually get lower thermic effect of, effect, effect of food if you're dieting because you're eating less food, or if you're um, eating a lot of food, you have a higher thermic effect. Uh, BMR, you're a higher body mass, you're gonna get more calorie burn just from being a heavier weight. So like someone who's obese and they come to me, a lot of time I may need to give them like 3,000 calories and they'll be in a deficit because they just weigh more. Um, they may have more muscle mass as a result of weighing more too. But yeah, so that's basically what happens. This happens on either end of the scale, calorie deficit, calorie surplus, you get compensations and they offset. And this is why we need to make adjustments because these things eventually can put you at, at positive uh, or neutral energy balance, meaning you're eating a lot of food, but eventually your body compensates so much that it becomes your caloric maintenance, right? And you need to increase your calories. You go on to the next one. 